Wars of the 2020s and 2030s. Now, I'm sure this is a topic that's more on people's minds since the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which took place on February 24th, 2022, which as of the time of recording this in June 2022, is still a conflict that is going on. Now, what if Altist made this before 2022? Uh, to be exact, he made this September 25th, 2020. So we have two years of sort of hindsight, if you will, um, for his predictions that he made two years ago. So he made this right at sort of the peak, well, not quite the peak, but the second peak of the pandemic. And I'm curious what he has to say about the wars of the 2020s and 2020 and 2030s. Um, once again, if you like the content, like, comment, subscribe, it all helps us. And let's have a look at this, albeit depressing, but necessary to think about topic. The last 80 years have been called the long peace, in that True. since the Second World War, there's been no major wars between important industrialized countries. This is not the norm. The history of the world is effectively the history of war. Nearly mm. all the countries in history have been in a permanent state of waging war or preparing for the next war. The periods of peace, whether the Pax Romana or the long peace of the 19th century, have been precious respites normally caused by one military power being so preeminent as to making war idiotic for anyone else. For a variety of reasons which I mentioned in a previous video, the internet- If you guys want me to check that one out, leave a comment below and say, hey, video life, check out Why is the World Crazy Now by What If Altist, and then I will do it. The national scene is showing immense tension. The possibility for any of many wars breaking out in the near future is going up. This is a video to talk about the possible flashpoints for a conflict in the next 15 to 20 years. I'm not expecting okay. all of these- Interesting that Ukraine is, uh, is white here, so. Wars to break out, and some won't happen in the 2020s or 30s, with this video awkwardly stretching in parts to mid-century, but it's the best we can do when predicting the future. This expects to make a general overview of the highest possibilities for conflicts. A lot of the specifics that how these wars would be fought and who would win, I'll cover in a future video about World War III. And if you're interested in that video, I've already reacted to it. Check out the title card in the top right here. I'll link, uh, I'll link the video there. So with that done, let's start. Okay. Interesting. An ego trip in which I vomit my reading list back at you. So if I remember correctly, he's actually really quite influenced by... Um, I think he's an economist named Thomas Cian, Thomas Cian. I don't remember off the top of my head, um, but I've been recommended to check him out because of a lot of a lot of what if altists thoughts really are influenced by him. So that's something I'll have to do in my uh, my spare time. So maybe I can get a little bit more context into sort of what if uh, into what if uh, into what what if altist thinks. Heck of a sentence. The world today is an absolutely fascinating place, and one that's in flux at that. It's really hard to keep track of all the various currents taking place because everything is moving so fast. Should we be focused Especially on at that China, time. the Middle East, the US election, or Africa? Well, Magellan TV is a great start. <laughs> Founded by <laughs> filmmakers, Magellan TV is a documentary Another... streaming service with a rich geopolitics section. I really like their documentary. Another very, Danger very Zone, smooth which... ad transition. Very nice. Very nice. This is the one that worries me the most. And this is the one that Canada, I think, will play a big, really big part in. For those who don't know, I'm a Canadian. Him and I are both Canadians. Um, we grew up relatively in the same area of, of uh, uh, Southeast Ontario. So I have a feeling that Canada is going to come up in this one. But let's see what he says about water wars. As global population, and especially people's standards for quality of life around the world rise, tensions over resources is basically inevitable. This is compounded by global warming, which in gross simplification makes the Arctic wetter while the tropics drier, yep. resulting in more water scarcity in some very populated regions. Of all the topics involved here, water wars tend to be the most intractable and the most likely, since, in general, for the countries involved, the water is an existential issue they're willing to die over. 
As upriver nations dam up the rivers, under most circumstances, a war is very likely unless True. there's some variable I can't see. This amounts to an issue of survival for many of the downriver nations, which will do anything and everything to keep what often amounts to their only water supply. If a downriver nation loses their water supply, they effectively lose their independence at best and at worst are simply erased from existence. The first example of a war like this is the Ethiopia-Egypt water dispute. Ethiopia mm. is building the Renaissance Dam to block up the Blue Nile, blocking Egypt's water supply. Just for some statistics, Egypt is 95% dependent on the Nile for its water supply. And so Crazy, look at this, uh, this satellite view, that's... wow. I hadn't actually seen this sort of view of Egypt before. That's that's crazy. So the 10% decline in the Nile's river water that's projected could see Egyptian farmland outside the delta decline by 30% and in the delta by a quarter. Hydropower losses could be up to 30%. Some studies show a 46% decline in agricultural land as a relatively plausible option. Remember, this is a country where a significant percentage of the population are subsistence farmers. Ethiopia's incentive here is that this dam would provide enough cheap energy to power the entire nation of Ethiopia, as well as much of Sudan. In fact, bribing Sudan with electricity, the next nation downriver by the Nile, is what resulted in Sudan siding with Ethiopia in this issue against Egypt. Similarly, Sudan is much less dependent on the Nile due to a combination of natural higher rainfalls and aquifers. There is an And what's interesting too is that now, again, with the benefit of hindsight that we have in 2022 here, um, obviously there's the conflict in Ethiopia that's going on right now um, and that has been sort of waging over the past uh, couple of months. And I wonder, unfortunately, I don't know a lot about Ethiopia and the conflict there, but I wonder how that's being affected. Um, now as well. Maybe you guys can help me out there in the comments. element of a proxy war here, with Iran and Turkey supporting Ethiopia, while Israel, the Gulf Arab states, and Saudi Arabia are Egyptian allies. In a direct war, none of these nations would likely get directly involved. At the end of August, Egypt and Ethiopia failed to reach an agreement, which means Ethiopia will press ahead without compromise from Egypt. This has resulted in the U.S. pulling aid out of Ethiopia, which was more of a Chinese ally anyway. Neither of these countries okay. are world powers, and thus are under the influence of the great powers. Ethiopia would probably stop building the dam if China, their paymaster, bullied them enough, but China doesn't have a reason to do this. Also, Ethiopia is experiencing immense internal issues, with a good yes. possibility of civil war in the near future. And... Boom. He's, uh, he's hit the hit the nail on the head with, uh, with that one. Yeah. With the rebellion of the Tigray tribal group, which would delay or prevent this issue for a good while. Egypt, with its historically abysmal military, and which currently has absolutely no military projection ability to fight across Sudan and Ethiopia, would lose the war. Yeah, and a lot of these these very large land wars that have happened between African countries, right? One that I can think of is between Libya and Chad. Over a uh, over a border dispute, there they they never turn out very well, and a lot of the times the the attacking force will lose. Um, and I can imagine that something similar would happen here between Egypt, Sudan, and, and Ethiopia. And and not only that, that more conflict in the region is obviously not good for the countries that are around it, because oftentimes the conflict spills into these other con uh, countries too. Ethiopia is also a mountainous country with a reputation for being difficult to conquer and the people really hard fighters. If just ask the Italians. The Nile is dammed up, it would be the worst humanitarian crisis in history. Egypt is a population of 100 million and even if 2%, a ridiculously conservative number, were to be displaced, then that would already be one of the bigger refugee crises in history. If the more probable number of around 30 million would be displaced, that would be a crisis large enough to completely change European civilization. Europe would have to become anti-immigration and completely change its ideology or stop existing. The second region with what The other thing too is that those were only the ones, uh, those were the only the Syrian refugees just in Germany. There was also a lot of Syrian refugees that were um, in Greece and Turkey, right? Turkey took the overwhelming share of Syrian refugees. Um, yeah, Italy, Greece, uh, and a lot of them ended up in Germany because Germany had were, well, again, this is still a divisive political issue to this day. Um, however, they were the ones that sort of 
went with the EU protocol of understanding um, their understanding of how refugees were to be dealt with in the EU. Um, and, you know, that still has effects to this day, seven years later. Water-based politics is the Tigris and Euphrates, which flows through Iraq from the headwaters in Turkey. Turkey is currently damming both of these rivers, which, like Egypt, Iraq is practically entirely dependent upon. In my live streams, I've said many times before that I think Turkey will be a great power in the future. Turkey is currently expanding okay. in every direction, and Iraq is likely part of this. Control of these rivers would grant the Turks control over this entire region, which historically isn't that surprising, since this region has always been controlled by massive multi-ethnic empires, with the Turks controlling Iraq for the vast majority of the last 1,000 years. This, in fact, isn't that different from the general principle of irrigation empires, but on a broader scale. Irrigation societies are nearly hmm. always god-king aristocracies with grinding poverty for the vast majority of the population, with the single river basin united since whoever controls the centralized water system has control over the entire region and can starve any dissidents of water. However, this time, rather than being the god-kings of Sumer or Akkad, the people in charge of the water are the Turks. Moving east, another region to worry about for water wars as sent Interesting, though, because... I wonder if it is sort of that simple that who controls the water controls the power. It's an interesting idea, but hmm. I, I, I must admit Turkey is definitely one of my blind spots too. It's not something that I know quite a lot about. I know more about North America in particular and Europe and a bit more about Asia. But uh, okay, interesting. Let's, let's see what he has to say about this, uh, this region. Central Asia. Tajikistan is damming up Uzbekistan, another desert nation's water. Central Asia is really interesting in that it's a competing battleground between Russian, Chinese, Islamist, and local authoritarian interest groups. However, the overriding variable is the doubling of population since 1990, which creates immense pressures upon the local environment. This is combined with the drying up of the Aral Sea, which has further desertified the local environment. This is combined with stagnant economic growth and a brutally oppressive political system. Mm. Of all the areas in the world, I'm most worried about Central Asia, in which all these variables coalesce. Something very bad will happen soon in Central Asia. I just don't know what. I've heard some scenarios in which Uzbekistan would take the gloves off, conquer much less populous Tajikistan in order to secure their water supply, and then become a regional hegemon based around the greater Uzbek identity. This is possible. Uzbekistan is militarily, demographically, and logistically far ahead of its neighbors, but I'm not sure it's enough to pull it off. An issue with that is that Uzbekistan, I wish I knew being more at the about center this of the, the map, world. if it decided to become a great power, would provoke the wrath of China, Russia, and possibly a more powerful future version of Iran, who would crush them. Which brings another possibility that this region gets can. <laughs> I think this is more what if altists uh, imperialist dream. I've seen this map twice now. I think in the um, what would World War Three look like, or is, is World War Three going to happen soon, or, or whatever the title was. Check out that video if you haven't seen it. Um, <laughs> yeah, this seems a little little. This seems far fetched to me. Um, while these sort of smaller things about these these water wars, admittedly in parts of the world that I don't know too much about, that's why I'm not really pausing to commentate. Um, okay, sorry, my microphone fell over. Main point being, um, yeah, this seems a little far fetched to me, but. Let's continue on with the video. ...mobilized by one of the great powers. An equally plausible scenario is one in which the whole region collapses into chaos, sort of like the Middle East before 2011, given that, in abstract, the conditions are remarkably similar between the two given situations. The fourth, and in my opinion, by far the most horrifying and deadly water war is that between India and China, in which... <laughs> The Chinese are building 300 dams in their border with India in the Himalaya Mountains in order to strangle India's source of the Ganges and Brahmaputra rivers. China's not willing to negotiate on this, and a billion people are dependent on these rivers, meaning this is an absolutely horrifying prospect lingering over us. A large portion of this comes from a Chinese position of weakness, with much of the north of China projected to run out of water in 2030. The North Chinese Plain is actually relatively well watered, all things considered. However, this mm. is more caused by the massive water needs of their industrial sector, 
and the amount of their water that's polluted afterwards. However, if China can secure India's water and doesn't just cut it, they could basically use it as a bargaining chip against the Indians to effectively turn India into a Chinese puppet state. The Chinese have done a wonderful geopolitical work with surrounding India. Pakistan, Nepal, Burma, Sri Lanka, and Iran are all now Chinese allies of some flavor. India is the only anti-Chinese holdout in South Asia, and thus if it falls... But Sri Lanka? Okay. It will effectively give China control over the vast majority of the continent of Asia. India is also an American ally, and if India and China were to get into a war over the water, America, knowing that India by itself would lose a war against China very badly... Would you be so quick to say that, though? I, I wonder. I mean, something like that would just be an unparalleled conflict. Um... India, if India and China went to war, both considering that China is a nuclear power, um, I wouldn't be so quick to say that India would be immediately lost. And something like this would just be, I mean, this could easily be something where it's the start of World War III, um, which I already talked about in that in that one video. But I don't know, I wouldn't be so quick to say that, that China would immediately destroy India, which is what we've We've seen with the Russian-Ukraine conflict, a lot of commentators, myself included, had thought that Russia would very quickly, you know, take out um, Ukraine, for lack of a better word. Um, and I think the whole world has been surprised by the resilience um, and the sort of strategic failures of the Russian army. So I wonder if we would see a similar scenario here. Would it be on the Indian side? Would it be on the Chinese, Chinese side? I don't know would side with India in order to keep India strong and thus prevent Chinese hegemony over Asia. An Indian-Chinese water war could easily become a world war. Not to yeah, mention definitely. just how brutally horrifying this war would be. For example, India and China are both nuclear powers and combined have populations larger than the entire worlds during World War II. Crazy. The casualties would easily be the worst in history of any war. Yep. Yeah, and you would just need to think the amount, especially if this was over water with the amount of starvation, you know, uh, the amount of resources that wouldn't be available anymore. It would just be horrendous, absolutely horrendous, um, if we did see something like this. In the centuries to come, Russia and China's decades of communism will be seen as a major turning point in history, since it wrought long-term shifts to both nations that will effectively become time bombs and less dealt with. A really big one of these is demographics. Communism was- It's your boy, not Raid Shadow Legends, demographics. Very effective at keeping nations poor while lowering their birth rates. You've seen this under every area that was under communist control for more than a couple decades. For example, under Stalin's reign, Russia's average birth rate per woman went from 6.5 children to 2.8, and then went beneath replacement levels in the 70s. Declines in birth rates were seen, were seen the, in the West, but not to a comparable extent. Interesting, but I mean... Plus the amount of mass death, uh, incarcerations um, that went on during these, this reign of terror uh, during the Stalinist period would obviously lead to lower fertility rates too, just surely from the amount of people dying as well. You also need to consider things like the Holodomor that happened in Ukraine. Um, so just the amount, just the insane amount of mass death that happened during this period. Um, yeah, I mean, of, of, uh, you know, your fertility rate would obviously uh, go down. Similarly, China's one-child policy resulted in a horrifying situation of having every generation. You yep. see, the correlation between urbanization and birth rate is pretty high. Once societies get more urban, people have less kids. Definitely. In general, this results in the wealthy nations having older populations, but at the same time being rich enough to support them better. Yes. Communism did the foolhardy thing of prematurely forcing people off the farms into the cities while the economy was still poor, which resulted in poor and old societies. For example, the average American from a wealthy country is younger than the average Russian or Chinese person, much poorer countries. The politics of mm. aging are that the elderly are effectively a societal drain that they consume and don't produce, while the young are the opposite. But when the young reach a certain critical mass, political instability results. 
In recent years, Europe's geopolitical impotence and the Middle East's endless civil wars have much to do with the politics of aging. However, the Russian and Chinese elites know that they only have so much time to act before their populations become so elderly they won't have enough young people to have effective military states. In China, this is even more acute in that Chinese economy is dependent upon its cheap labor that it exports to the rest of the world. China is dangerously close to reaching the middle income trap, in which one isn't rich enough to be a domestic consumption-based economy, and not poor enough to use cheap labor as an advantage in the global marketplace, with an aging population, which is the mm. worst possible combination. Russia, meanwhile, is situated in a flat plain with no defensible boundaries, and thus must use its size in of itself as its biggest advantage. Russia And a lot of the soft power that, uh, so well, the hard power that Russia has, which it was shown before the Ukrainian war, um, of, of being, you know, this big, scary country, which uh, I think Russia sort of shown to be a, a paper tiger um, in the past, in in during this conflict. Russia has always used... Which, whether that will harden the sort of Chinese... Who knows? We'll see. ...its massive population as cannon fodder to make up for its lack of defensible borders. But what happens once Russia's population is neither large nor young? This is why Russia and China are currently acting so aggressively. Both know they have a limited time frame to become stakeholders in the global system in order Oof. to start racking in the rent before their retirements kick in. Wow. Expect Russia to act very recklessly in the years to come. The current Belarus crisis is the perfect opportunity in which the discrediting Lukashenko creates the perfect op Short-term predictions tend not to age well, so please don't judge me too hardly, future. Well, you definitely got one thing right. Opportunity for Putin to step in and bring order, which would have him enact the planned wow. union state between Belarus and Russia. I don't think Russia will have a war with Europe, but if it were to be caused by anything, it would be an aggressive Russian action resulting in a miscommunication that would spiral into war due to Russia's desperation. Much okay. of China's Belt and Road is to create a young subject population across Asia that they can sell goods to. As China's population ages, it can sell goods to the developing young populations across Asia and Africa. Or at least that's the plan. China is completely dependent upon food, natural resource, and oil supplies that come by sea, almost all of which come through the Straits of Malacca. This means the Americans, as the preeminent naval power, basically have a trump card. A yeah, and uh, I remember reading online somewhere that the United States spends more money um, patrolling the Mediterranean Sea than Italy, France, and the United Kingdom combined on their navy. So the the amount that the United States spends on naval um, on, on naval vessels and you know basically spends on having naval superiority, for lack of a better term, is is just unmatched to any other country in the world. Um, whether you think this is a good thing, whether you think this is a bad thing, that's a political question. Um, however, it, it can't be denied that the sheer resources that the United States spends. Um, in their navy and on their naval power is, is pretty much unparalleled to any other country in the world. Big reason the Chinese are trying to build the Belt and Road is in order to create a land-based order by which they can transport everything they need, such as food and oil, by land over Central Asia rather than by sea. A big issue here is that if China can actually find a way to knit Asia together by land, it will unite a majority of the human race. This would be a death blow hmm. to the American-European naval-based world system, which carries the vast majority of the world's trade. There is a precedent to this, where for the vast majority of history, the center of the world wasn't the oceans, but Eurasia, and so a return to this wouldn't be abnormal. Whether China can okay. become or survive as a great power is in a large part determined upon whether it can build this Eurasian trade alliance before their aging crushes them. But what's interesting, though, is that Within this trade war, I'd be curious, and I don't have the data in front of me, unfortunately, but I'd be curious which one earns, uh, so who would have the higher GDP? So it would be the United States, but then I also, if you if you put all the trading partners combined, I would wonder who would have the higher GDP here. I would assume it would be the US um, and, the, and the sort of Western powers, but still looking at this map, and that's uh, that's quite interesting. But I mean... The overall thing here is that this is this is I mean this is the modern state of the world. 
um, with free trade and yeah, quite fascinating even to look at something like uh, Australia here, Spain, that's uh, allegedly more towards, well, looks equal, but slightly leading China. Um, yeah, fascinating. The Chinese elite knows this, and that's where the danger lies. Africa has the exact opposite issue of this, in that they have had massive population growth and a young population with borders that make no sense, entrenched <laughs> self-serving elites, and not enough economic growth to justify it all. And a lot of those borders that make no sense are a result of the sort of scramble for Africa and the multiple amount of conflicts that have gone on since the, in the decades since... Um, as well as in the Middle East, too, the borders there really just don't make any sense. Well, if this sounds familiar, it's what's resulted in the last 10 years of death in the Middle East. But yeah, and there's been a lot of democratic blacks, black sliding, backsliding um, in Africa and in lots of uh, places in the world too. In the past, uh, in the past 10 years, there's definitely been uh, more conflict. Um, particularly in this region. Africa has all the issues above, but worse. I mean, you just can't look at projections that say stuff like Lagos in Nigeria is supposed to have a population of 30 million in 2050 in a country with practically no infrastructure, exports to pay for the food, or effective supply chains. The massive slums that would incur would be the perfect breeding ground for disease and political radicalism. When you see this across the whole continent writ large, a continent with declining amounts of water due to climate change, and without the economic or systemic growth to support the numbers involved, you have a catastrophe waiting. I'm just not sure if this will strike in the 2020s or 2030s. Fascinating. Hmm. So, I really don't have much to say this video. Don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but yeah, wow, he makes some really interesting points, um, particularly on that side of the world where I'm just not as familiar with. But yeah, let's keep going to uh, the final part here. There's this idea of Thucydides' trap, by which the dominant power will try to crush the rising one before the rising one becomes powerful enough to overpower the dominant one. Hmm. The quintessential example of this is the Peloponnesian War, in which the war broke out since Athens was developing quickly and would overtake Sparta unless Sparta did something first. In the book by Graham Allison of the same name, 15 examples of it were shown in the last 500 years of European history. I think the big difference here, though, is that you can see here that since nuclear weapons, right? So number 13 here, we have no war, right? I'm sure he'll bring this up here in a, in a minute, but nuclear weapons really are the game changers um, of everything. I mean, as everyone knows, mad, mutually assured destruction. Um, and I, I think I'm a bit more optimistic on this, but I don't see, and I talked about this in the World War III video, I don't see any sort of large-scale conflicts um, breaking out, but let's see what he says. 12 resulted in a war. It's often used as a tool to describe the U.S.'s relationship with China, by which China gets more powerful by the day, while the U.S. stagnates by comparison. Fascinating thing, though. Uh, last quarter, as of uh, recording this uh, June 2022, the United States actually had more growth than China. Right. And so there are some economic theories now that China sort of hit its peak and it's only going to sort of stagnate and sort of level out from here. So this means that it's inside the U.S.'s self-interest to crush China before it gets significantly more powerful enough to threaten the United States. This has validity, but another way of looking at it is from the perspective of the previous section, by which China will be crushed by aging population while the U.S. has stable population growth. The issue we run into here and we faced before in the history of the world is this is something that i just need to look more into is that what the effects of elderly populations are on nations um do elderly just consume curious i'd have to look i'd have to read more into this what, what do you guys think let me know below that like high school the nations and people's insecurity often have little knowledge of others' insecurities and weaknesses. The prime historical example of this was before World War I, in which the British and French were worried that the Germans would overtake them if they did nothing. Well, the Germans <laughs> were worried that the Russians would overtake them if they did nothing. Meanwhile, the Russians and Austrians were worried that if they did nothing, their empires would get torn apart by modernization and ethnic nationalism. This resulted in mass insecurities and recklessness in the part of European governments, which resulted in the First World War. People... 
Uh, and a lot of other issues too, but yeah, there's definitely run on that. Fail to realize that the First World War didn't start due to chance or madness. It was a series no. of tiny, rational decisions of self-preservation yep. that collectively killed everyone. A very similar definitely. issue is occurring today in that the Japanese, Indians, Americans, and Vietnamese are worried that if they do nothing, they will be crushed by China. Similarly, the Chinese and Russians have the population insecurity mentioned above. Under similar circumstances, the Turks know that they're in a region with massive aging populations and decaying economies. With their young and booming economy, they can start throwing their weight around in a big way. North Korea is the apex of this. Their <laughs> regime knows it's a relic of another age living on borrowed time. And Do they? So is desperately trying to invest in nuclear weapons in order to bully the outside world into concessions that will keep itself alive for a few years more. North Korea, meanwhile, is a yeah, Chinese just... ally, and so if the Americans were to invade it, it would result in American troops on the Chinese border. This would be unacceptable to Beijing, and yeah, we all know what happened last time that happened in the 50s. In its immense weakness, North Korea is a major danger to the geopolitical world. There is a very different kind of time pressure that's created by the sudden rise of coronavirus. For reasons explained in the previous video, most of the world's population was right. barely getting by due to the rising cost of living. When this was compounded by the COVID economic crisis, it created massive desperate populations. Desperate populations have historically tended to go into two directions, either towards internal strife or external wars. Governments often turn to external opponents in order to unite the nation or try to use war as a way of changing the rules of the international system to their favor in order to make their populations wealthier and their countries more powerful. The incentive to do this rises as internal strife grows. China is very much the apex of this, in that the reason the Chinese Communist Party continues to rule China while communism collapsed everywhere else was since the communists made an implicit deal with the Chinese people, by which, in exchange for higher wages and a better standard of living, the Chinese people yep. would agree to accept all the repression and corruption. True. With the economic slowdown and... I think... It might be a bit more complicated than that, obviously, but uh, yeah, to say that, to say even that the Chinese government is communist, I've talked about this before, but it's true communism exists, true communism exists in a stateless, um, you know, sort of, it exists in a stateless state. So there's no, there's no government, there's no, it doesn't exist. But China is, they're certainly socialist, whatever, however you want to define that. Um, but they've adapted as well, right? So after Mao's Great Leap Forward, there was reforms in the 70s, um, and that sort of led them to the position that they're in today. So they're sort of in an authoritarian, socialist-type state. Um, but again, this isn't something that I'm an expert on in any manner, so that's sort of my surface-level reading of it, and, and I might have a few things wrong there. Most likely I do, so... Let me know what you guys think below. Occurred by the trade war and coronavirus. This basically destroys the raison d'etre for the communist regime. For example, China has stopped pushing for their Made in China 2025 initiative, which was effectively based upon stealing Western technology and using it hmm. to make their economy a high-tech and quality production center, since the West cracked down on Chinese technological theft, thus making the plan untenable. This is likely part of the reason that China is currently going through a new wave of repression and trying to instigate ideological fervor, and that they're trying to keep their population under control after they stop providing their side of the deal. Yeah, a lot to cut through there. Don't really have much to say. It sounds really rich coming from an American, but the era of American hegemony has been the greatest age in history. Yeah. Statistically, yeah. They don't mean to be chauvinistic, but no matter what metric you look at, whether nutrition, health, literacy, True. personal yep. freedom, peace, wealth, or national self-determination, it's writ large. This is since the U.S. has agreed to protect a huge number of countries from foreign conquest, which has incentivized countries to work together rather than conquer and oppress each other. Meanwhile, the U.S. policed the entire world's oceans, thus opening up the entire world to cheap and safe oceanic commerce. The yep. U.S. did accrue many benefits from this, like cheap credit, but these disproportionately helped the American upper classes and hurt the American middle class, which was hollowed out by competition Wait, with what did that upper say? class. In fact, the societies that do the most criticism, Canada and Western Europe, are then themselves 
creations of the American empire. In a world without America, they would have to slash their welfare budgets and fight wars in the Middle East for oil. I, I don't know if Canada really falls into that. I think we're definitely one of the biggest benefits of this. Um, but okay. Classes ...and hurt the American middle class, which was hollowed out by competition with cheaper foreign workers. American industry and society was hurt by the U.S. creating a world system with which everyone had free trade with America, but most of the world kept tariffs against America. Since those who benefited from the American world system inside America were greatly outnumbered by those who didn't, we're seeing a revolt from inside hmm. America against that very system. America feels the need to renegotiate its position of power around the world. What most foreigners don't understand is that America really doesn't need the rest of the world. America has a rate of dependency on the rest of the world's economy similar to countries like Sudan, Ethiopia, or Cuba. But also China's not that far there either at 19.8%. Interesting that Nigeria's 92 I wonder what Canada's at. Probably very low. Or sorry, very high. The U.S. is a net exporter in oil, food, industrial goods, and basically any other material you can think of. But the main thing, too, is that this is what makes the United States so rich. So to say that they're not reliant on them, it's like, yes, okay, well, that is true. But there's significant detriments um, if you're to stop trading, right, with your partners. So... Yeah, okay, well, we don't need you, so to say, and this is what something that you hear in sort of uh, politics from, I don't know, the separatists like in, in Texas or in Quebec, right, that you don't, uh, I'll speak more on Quebec because that's something that I know more about. Um, well, okay, yes, that might be true. It comes at a great cost, right? And I think that that's sort of something that needs to be said as well. Over the next 20 or 30 years, we'll see the total U.S. removal of power from areas like the Middle East, whose oil the U.S. no longer needs, and the Could rest be. of the world, yeah. except the first world areas and that are wealthy enough too. for the U.S. to continue to justify maintaining influence over them. The U.S. will no longer protect the whole world's oceanic traffic in the way it used to. I'm guessing the U.S. will stay in areas like Europe or the Far East, but the U.S. is sick of losing money on maintaining troops in other continents. This will either result in the U.S. starting to take tribute from these regions in one form or another in exchange for America's protection, or these countries start expending their own militaries. This would start to weaken American control of these regions. Once the French and Germans start to have very good militaries, how willing to listen to America will they be? Another thing to consider is that the... And with, uh, with the Ukrainian crisis going on right now, the answer is uh, very only way the U.S. would be able to win a war against Russia or China would be by arming the Japanese, Germans, and Turks to the teeth against them. You're bringing, uh, bringing two-thirds of the Axis back together. And again, I've already talked about this, but I, I don't think we'll ever see something like this where we'll have great conflicts between superpowers um, ever again. Arming and militarizing these nations would change geopolitics in too big a way to describe. America's removal would create an immense power vacuum in much of the world. Most African True. countries, yeah. for example, have absolutely terrible militaries, and the only way they haven't been recolonized, collapsed into different countries, or cannibalized each other is that the American world system will crush anyone who does so. That will end. Also, in areas okay. where the countries are weak and of little reason to exist besides a European diplomat said so, they'll be gone. Turkey and Iran secondarily as... Pa Pakistan, though? All right. Powerful, industrialized, populous, and militarized countries that sit in the middle. Yeah, so this is one thing that I just do not understand. How the, the, the second Ottoman Empire, which he hypothesizes and he's brought up a few times... The fact that Turkey would have as much influence on Bulgaria, um, oh god, um, uh, no, not Macedonia, yeah, that's Macedonia, Greece and Romania, I wanted to say that's Montenegro, but I think that's there, or is that Montenegro, I'm sorry, Balkan boys, anyways, um, yeah, that just seems a little ridiculous to me, and to say that Israel as well, I mean, this is where I think I mostly disagree with what if altist, but so far in this video, 
I haven't had too much to say. All of this will benefit enormously and build large empires when America stops caring. Similarly, with America no longer protecting Europe's oil interests, you could see European countries, with the prime example being France, Western Europe's most active military power, who already has lots of influence in West Africa, recolonizing or spreading influence in Africa in order to gain the oil and other resources America is no longer willing to foot the bill for. Well, that was that a that dark one. video. Uh, if you liked yeah. it, please like, comment. Yeah, that was uh, that was definitely a dark one. Sorry that I didn't really have much to comment on in our in our usual videos where I can give you guys some interesting facts and hopefully add something to the video. In this one, uh, yeah, didn't really have too much to say. I hope you guys liked it. Let me know what you think in the comments. Uh, I'm sure this will be an interesting comment discussion. Or who knows, maybe you don't like this kind of content. It's like, hey, get back to the World War II stuff. Get back to the stuff you know. Let me know what you guys think. If you made it this far, thank you very much. Yeah, leave a comment. Let me know what you think. See you guys in the next video. Bye-bye.